Okay, well, I've already read the text, so let's go ahead and begin looking at this uh, particular psalm. Uh, as you know, in Psalm 73, the psalmist is reflecting on how things were going with him compared to how they were going for the wicked. Now, the psalmist believed as he, as he opens up the psalm that God is good, you know, to Israel. He's good to the righteous. He knows that God blesses the righteous. Um, reflecting, you know, it, well, this is also reflected in Psalm 1, and let me just read that portion. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Now, the psalmist was aware of that blessing, but he was also aware of the fact that God curses the wicked, as, again, Psalm 1 reminds us, that those who practice sin are like chaff which the wind drives away. The wicked, he says, will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. God blesses the righteous, but he curses the wicked. But again, as he reflects on his situation and that of the wicked around him, things seem to be turned around. Now, he confesses that he had loved and obeyed God. He says in verse 13, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Now, again, no man is perfect, but um, we know there are occasions where David will say something similar to this. You know, I've, I've, I've walked in my integrity. I've, I've carried out the law. And we know that um, no man, as I've said, is going to be flawless in every way. But generally speaking, he was following the Lord. And yet, the result was, he was going through a very difficult time. He says in verse 14, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. This doesn't add up. On the other hand, he said things were going well for those who hated God. They seemed to be prospering. You know, uh, why, he was asking uh, the question, why are the wicked blessed while the righteous seem to be cursed? Well, as he considered these things, he says it brought him to the verge of falling away. He says in verse 2, but as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. And you know, he's, he's not the only one who's ever experienced these kinds of things. Uh, when God seems to bless when people are not obeying him versus uh, blessing them when, he, when you do obey him. Sometimes it seems just the opposite, and there's an example in Scripture in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah is ministering to the Jews who had fled into Egypt, and they weren't supposed to go to Egypt. They were supposed to stay in the land, and if they stayed in the land, they would be safe. They would be taken into captivity. Well, these Jews apparently not only fled into Egypt to avoid God's um, exile, his, his discipline for their sins, but while they were in Egypt, they began worshiping some of the false gods of Egypt, and things seemed to be going well for them. And so as they're making this comparison, they wanted to stick to doing the wrong thing because of the blessings that were coming. But so when Jeremiah rebukes them for this uh, in the name of the Lord, as he brings that message, this is the way they answered him. And by the way, this is an example of those who did what the psalmist was in danger of doing. He says, as for the message that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we are not going to listen to you, but rather we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her just as we ourselves, our forefathers, our kings and our princes did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food. And we're well off and saw no misfortune. But since we stopped burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have met our end by the sword and by famine. Perhaps they're referring here to Asherah because that was a particular liability the Jews had in the land of Canaan. When they worshipped her, 
things went well. But when they did what the Lord called them to do, things would go difficult, right? would go very, very hard for them. And you can see that was the same struggle the psalmist was having. Now, we know that following Christ can sometimes be difficult. It can come at a very high cost. Sometimes it can cost you your family. Sometimes it can cost you your friends. Think about what Jesus said. Don't think that I have come to bring peace, but a sword. I have not come, you know, to, um, well, those, there will be those in a household. Some will follow me and some won't, and I will divide households. And, there, you know, and those within a household will have to choose sides. Uh, more often than not, we will have less of the world's nicer things to enjoy. People are going to hate us because uh, we're going to take a stand on particular issues that aren't necessarily popular in this political climate. Or maybe we're going to point out things that other people do that are wrong, or maybe things they're doing that we can't join in, and that's going to be a rebuke to them. Or maybe they're just going to hate us because we tell them about Jesus. Following Christ can be a difficult thing. And we know that when we're going through all these difficulties, you know, those who aren't following Christ um, can seem to have it a lot easier than, than we have it, and it can tempt us to look at the grass on the other side of the fence, so to speak, and find ourselves asking this question, is Christianity real? Are the things that I read about in the Bible, are they true, and is it really worth it to give up all the things that I can see that I could enjoy right now for these blessings that I can't see but are promised to me in the future? Do I really gain anything by giving all this up and following Christ? And you know, as I was thinking about the struggle of the psalmist, as I was thinking about the fact that we also struggle, I mean, realize our children have also undoubtedly asked themselves these questions before they decided, those that have abandoned Christ, to abandon the Lord and His church. It didn't seem worth it to them to remain here worshiping the Lord. Again, this in, sort of these, this invisible kingdom and invisible blessing, so to speak, when the world was in front of them and promised so much pleasure and happiness. Well, Brooks reminds us this is simply another one of the devil's deceptions. He writes this, Satan says, Do you see, O soul, the many blessings that such and such enjoy, who walk in those very ways that your soul startles to think of, and the many crosses that they are delivered from, if ever you would be freed from the dark night of adversity and enjoy the sunshine of prosperity, you must walk in their ways. Well, this morning, you know, Brooks is going to remind us or at least equip us on how we can protect ourselves from that particular deception of the enemy. Okay? Now, first of all, he says we need to, re to remember that the outward, that outward blessings or afflictions in themselves are not indicators either that God loves us or that He is being faithful toward us. And again, the reason is because God gives them to both. Now remember, the psalmist thought that God was not treating him or the wicked as God should. You know, He should be blessing the righteous and cursing the wicked, but that's not what's happening. And so this was calling God's faithfulness into question. Well, Brooks reminds us that this is not something, uh, this isn't something we can know God's faithfulness purely from the circumstances themselves. This is what he writes. God's hand of mercy may be towards a man when his heart may be against that man, as you may see in Saul and others. And the hand of God may be set against a man when the heart of God is dearly set upon a man, as you may see in Job. The hand of God was severely set against him, and yet the heart and affections of God were strongly working towards him. You can't tell by the circumstances. Remember what Jesus said in um, Matthew 5, 45? That his Father is good to everyone, to all his creation. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know, Jesus says, both the, the righteous and the wicked receive from God's hand every day. Brooks would remind us that Abraham was wealthy, but so was Pharaoh. 
was an indication of, of you know, whether God approved them or not. And as a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards notes that, and you've heard me say this before, that God more often gives riches to the wicked because he knows how worthless these riches really are. Brooks writes this, usually the worst of men have most of these outward things. Usually the holiest of men have least of earth, though most of heaven. So both receive the things of the Lord, uh, receive these outward blessings, but both Edwards and Brooks would remind us that the wicked usually have more of these things than the righteous. But he would also remind us that both receive adversity. Ahab was killed in battle, but so was Josiah. What's the difference between those two men? Ahab is a very wicked king. Josiah was a righteous king. Saul and Jonathan both died in the same battle on Mount Gilboa. The Jews that rebelled against God in the wilderness and were sentenced to wander for 40 years and were never able to enter into the promised land, same thing happened to Moses. Okay? Now, when we look at things like this, sometimes it seems like God is not being true to his word, but we know that he has reasons for the things that he does. He has reasons for blessing the wicked. He has reasons for bringing adversity on the righteous. And his reasons are always good reasons. You know, if the wicked don't repent, I'll have to answer for it later. For the righteous, adversity always makes us more like Jesus. Now, secondly, Brooks says God's goodness should never be used as a reason to turn away from him. Now, when the psalmist saw what the wicked were enjoying, as well as how difficult it was for him, he was tempted to abandon God, and sometimes we are as well. But we do need to remember that the blessings, even the blessings that the wicked are enjoying, they're coming from the Lord, and they're going to have to answer for them. Remember the Jews we read about earlier in Egypt, how they were tempted to continue to worship the Queen of Heaven because they were receiving certain blessings? Those blessings were actually coming from the Lord. It wasn't coming from the Queen of Heaven because she doesn't exist, right? God was continuing to show them His mercy. And the fact that they were using His mercy as the reason to continue in their idolatry rather than as a reason to repent of their idolatry only incensed him more. If I had more time, I'd read this passage, but God finally determined that not one of them were going to survive. They were all going to die in Egypt. Now, Paul tells us that God pours his wrath out daily on mankind for that same reason, that even though they, they knew God, they know him, they know he exists, they know that every good thing that they have comes from his hands, all these mercies, they do not honor him as God. They do not give him thanks, but instead use his goodness as a reason to sin. Brooks writes this, to argue from God's mercy to sinful liberty is the devil's logic. And such log logicians uh, do ever walk as upon a mine of gunpowder ready to be blown up. No such soul can ever avert or avoid the wrath of God. This is wickedness at the height for a man to be very bad because God is very good. So will we abandon the Lord for the blessings that the wicked are enjoying when we're abandoning the one who actually gives these blessings and making ourselves more culpable for abandoning him in order to receive his mercies. If we do that, Brooks is saying, the same thing may happen to us as what happened to the Jews in Egypt. Thirdly, he says the lack of prosperity should never concern us. It's really the lack of difficulty that should concern us. Again, think about the psalmist. He's saying, these guys are prospering. I'm having a difficult time. What Brooks is saying is, don't worry about that. Worry if you don't have a difficult time because Christians will have difficulties. Okay, uh, Brooks writes this, there is no greater misery in this life than not to be in misery. <laughs> no greater affliction than not to be afflicted. 
Woe, woe to that soul that God will not spend a rod upon. Now, he's simply reminding us here of what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 12, verse 6, and he's quoting Solomon from the Proverbs. Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Now, remember, the discipline often comes in the form of adversity, doesn't it? But the psalmist is reminding us, or excuse me, well, Solomon and the author to the Hebrews, that it is an expression of God's love for us, his fatherly love for us, that he uses it to make us more like Jesus. And because he disciplines all of his children, there are, there are no children who do not receive this discipline, we should be more concerned if we don't receive it. He says in verse 8, but if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now, I don't think Brooks or the author of the Hebrews is telling us here that if your life isn't miserable at all times, that doesn't mean that you're, you're not a Christian, okay? But what it means is if your life is free from adversity and you're just prospering all the time, well, something's wrong because God disciplines those whom he loves. We will go through adversity. So be more concerned if you're not going through difficult times, he's saying. Now, fourthly, Brooks asks the question, why should we envy the wicked when we have far more than they? He says, they lack a saving interest in God, Christ, the Spirit, the promises, the covenant of grace, and everlasting glory. The mercies which they enjoy are nothing to the mercies they lack. It is true they have honors and riches and pleasures and friends and are mighty in power. Their family is established and their offspring are before their eyes. Yet all this is nothing to what they lack. They lack a house that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. They lack those riches that perish not, the glory that fades not, the kingdom that shakes not. So he's asking, why should we be jealous of them when we have infinitely more than they have? Again, remember what Jesus says on the day of judgment, a man would give the world if he could um, to buy back his soul because it is so much more precious, uh, the soul, than everything that the world has to offer. And that's what we need to remember, that we have the redemption of our souls. We have an eternal kingdom. Everything that the wicked have to enjoy is only temporary. Think about another perfect example. Think about the rich man and Lazarus, how the rich man prospered in his life. Lazarus had a very difficult time, but in the end, it was just reversed. But Lazarus had what he had forever. So did the rich man in hell. And that'll be another point that uh, Brooks is going to bring up. Now, fifthly, though the wicked appear to be blessed outwardly, he says the same is not true inwardly. He writes, they have indeed a glorious outside, but if you view their insides, you will easily find a head full of cares and a heart full of fears. It was a good speech of an emperor. You gaze on my purple robe and golden crown, but did you know what cares are under it? You would not take it up from the ground to have it. Augustine wrote this, many are miserable by loving hurtful things, but they are more miserable by having them. So again, they do not have what is most important. We have really joy, inexpressible and full of glory. We have peace. We have that, that inward disposition, which is more precious than anything that the world has to offer. Finally, Brooks asks us to consider the end of the wicked. Now, remember how the psalmist struggled with the things he was seeing until he came into the sanctuary of God um, and he saw their end. He says in verses 17 through 20, Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise 
their form. Now, think of, think of Pharaoh as an example of, of this very thing. God had raised Pharaoh up in Egypt, had endowed him with power and riches. I mean, they were the greatest kingdom on earth at the time. But why did the Lord raise Pharaoh up? He says in Exodus 9, 16, in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. And the reason or the way he did that, of course, was by destroying Pharaoh, destroying his army, destroying his kingdom, destroying most, you know, most of the people in Egypt. He, he crippled him. But the reason he raised him up was that he might set him in slippery places so that he might be cast down, that God might be glorified. Brooks writes this, there is not a wicked man in the world that is set up with Lucifer as high as heaven, but shall with Lucifer be brought down as low as hell. And he says, don't forget, the wicked are going to have to answer for these things on the day of judgment. Brooks quotes Bernard writing this, and I was trying to find out which Bernard this was, Bernard of Clairvaux, I'm not really sure, probably him. But he says this, in that day, men shall give an account of good things committed unto them, of good things neglected by them, of evil committed by them, and of evils allowed by them. Then shall a good conscience be more worth than all the world's good. Brooks writes this, if God gives them these good things and does not sanctify them in his love, they will at last be witnesses against a man and millstones forever to sink a man in that day when God shall call men to an account, not for the use, but for the abuse of mercy. God keeps an exact account of every penny that is laid out upon him and his, and that is laid out against him and his. And this, in the day of account, men shall know and feel, though now they wink and will not understand. He said this also, as often as I think on that day, how does my whole body quake and my heart within me tremble? Can you think seriously of this, O soul? And not say, O Lord, I humbly crave that you will let me be little in this world, that I may be great in another world, and low here, that I may be high forever hereafter. See, that's really what matters. Again, coming into the sanctuary of God, seeing things the way we should see them. We need to see them in the way the Lord shows them to us. And we need to believe that, and we need to love the Lord and love the things of the Lord. Those are the things that will keep us moving in the right direction. So let me summarize what we've seen here by bringing these points up again just briefly. When the devil comes to you and he lies about God's faithfulness, you know, when your life seems hard, but it's easy for everyone else, for those that aren't following the Lord in particular, remember this. He says, whether your life is easy or hard, that's not an indicator of God's love or His faithfulness towards you. God gives blessing and adversity to both the righteous and the wicked, but for different reasons. Secondly, the goodness God shows should never be used as an excuse to turn away from Him, but a reason to turn towards Him because He is the source of those blessings. You see, you don't turn away from the Lord to get those things. He's the one who's giving them, and you get them by following Him at least the true riches. Thirdly, he says, it's not the lack of prosperity, but the lack of difficulty that should concern us. Because remember, God disciplines every one of his children because he loves us. He says, we should never envy the wicked when we have far more than they do in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the true riches given to us. They have things that, again, are going to perish forever. Think about Paul when he was saying, you know, that they... There are people who are all running this race and they do it to receive a perishable crown, one that's just going to turn into dust, but we, an imperishable crown. We, what we get from the Lord, we will have forever. And he says this, that even though the wicked may appear to be blessed outwardly, and maybe they are, they're not inwardly, they are racked with guilt and, you know, again, they suffer in conscience, but we have God's joy and we have the peace that passes all understanding. 
And then lastly, he says, though the wicked seem to prosper now, remember, they're going to have to answer for the things that they have done with what God has given to them on the day of judgment. And on that day, it's going to be far better to be in the Lord Jesus Christ than to have really possessed the entire world. So don't be envious of the wicked. And don't struggle when you're having difficult times wondering whether God loves you, whether or not He is faithful to you. He is faithful, and He does love you if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you do have the true riches. You don't have to be tempted by the devil to go after the things that really are only found, the true riches, in Christ. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to help us. And by the way, you know, our children have gone after the world, let's remember. They are under this deception. Perhaps some of these considerations, if the Lord gives us opportunity, we can also share with them. All right, well, let, let's pray.